So, so you have to be worried. And I think what has to worry you the most is, is it too late to make a change, right? I mean, are we so far behind the eight ball because the debt repayment is such a big part of the overall budget that, that, that there are, you know, the options are, are fewer and fewer. So I think if you're not worried, you're kind of Pollyanna about that. I, I can't, I can't imagine, I can't imagine what any administration would do to get us out of this current bind that we're in. It's been 115 years since investors had an opportunity like this. The Rockefellers, the Vanderbilts, and Henry Ford made a fortune from the last energy-powered vehicle revolution. Let's seize the moment in the hottest sector in the world right now. Visit crushthestreet.com slash win. Hello, everyone, and welcome into crushthestreet.com. I'm joined today with a brand new guest of the very popular website, stackingbenjamins.com. In fact, Kiplinger Magazine uh, called the podcast the best podcast. They got deemed the best podcast, and I'm here with the host, Joe Saul Sihai. And uh, if you go to the website, you can sign up and receive uh, the white paper called Launch Your Financial Rocket, Why You Shouldn't Take Advice from Dave Ramsey, Susie Orman, or The Motley Fool. And uh, I'm looking forward to discussing money and the markets with him today. Uh, Joe, thanks for joining me. Kenneth, so glad I made the cut. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, Joe, we actually have some interesting things to talk about. The markets are a little rattled at the moment. I, I mean, it would appear to be. We had the election yesterday, which was quite a Brexit-type uh, reaction with the markets, Trump shocking the establishment, and uh, really coming out as the underdog and you know, the futures markets were down, I think, as much as 900 points yesterday. Gold was up. But then we wake up today and, and the markets are up. Stocks are up and gold is just sort of flat. Uh, so we got to talk about what, what your initial reactions are to all of this. I think it's it's an ex uh, definitely last night as we record this was and the thing I think we need to remember with Brexit was that it was a trap, right? If somebody somebody tried to sell based on what happened during the during the Brexit downturn, you you got burned. So we definitely don't want to fall into this. The sky is falling. Things are going to be horrible. And I and I also, you know, I don't want to take the other tact either, Kenneth. I don't think that I want to be. Well, now everything's rosy. Everything's going to be better. The new administration's going to wipe away all the all the uh, Washington cronyism. That's all going to be gone. I think. Uh, I think right now, you know, if, if, if I'm a prudent investor, I think I'm still in a, uh, I don't have enough information to make a great decision uh, stance. I mm -hmm. think that's probably the best thing I could, I could tell your listeners. Yeah. Do you, does it concern you that, you know, we've seen reckless QE, you know, money printing from the central banks, you know, in 2008, there was $800 billion dollars on the Federal Reserve balance sheet. And then, you know, now it's $4 trillion. And the reaction to the 2008 crisis, and, you know, we've essentially just blew this bubble right back up. And, um, you know, we're, we're due for another recession. And we've kind of, the Federal Reserve at least, is out of ammo. I mean, we're at zero percent interest rates. Uh, they're talking like they're gonna raise interest rates, but, you know, really, I mean, it's anyone's guess whether they're going to be able to do it. And, you know, we saw what happened last year when they, they raised interest rates. The markets started off the worst ever on record. The January was the worst record uh, stock market uh, down month on uh, record. So, I mean, you know, what are your thoughts in general with the current situation of the economy? Well, imagine, Kenneth, if you and I ran our personal budget the way that the government, and not just the U.S. government, you look at a lot of the European governments, too, run their books. I mean, we, we would have been long into bankruptcy, right? Because we don't, have the, we don't have this printer in our basement where we can just go print more money. So, so you have to be worried. And I think what has to worry you the most is, 
is it too late to make a change, right? I mean, are we so far behind the eight ball because the debt repayment is such a big part of the overall budget that, that, that there are, you know, the options are, are fewer and fewer. So I think if you're not worried, you're kind of Pollyanna about that. I, I can't, I can't imagine, I can't imagine what any administration would do to get us out of this current bind that we're in. Hmm. And what are your thoughts on gold then? I mean, are you concerned about the the current U.S. dollar system, the fiat currency uh, system that's in place? Well, there's, you know, that's kind of the, the quick answer is yes to your second, your, your second half of that uh, in the fact that the dollar is not tied to anything. But, you know, what's funny is gold has its own challenges. I mean, I've had people that have uh, written to me and they said, hey, you know what? I, I don't trust stocks. So I'm getting more into gold. And as you know, Kenneth, gold is eight times more volatile than the stock market. So there's there's re- I like I like natural resources. Like if we expand away from gold to just natural resources in general and we look at things like like uh, uh, silver and mining and things that I can get my hands on I think that there's there's a bigger play there than just gold um, gold's gold's a tricky one by itself I kind of like the more diversified approach yeah well I mean what do you suppose the the end game will be for all the problems that are existing around the world with you know the currencies and uh, the loss of faith in you know what governments have become well the frustrating thing and this is actually this is our uh, you know my take is that being a, a guy who's been in the trenches with families those types of questions are kind of above my pay grade and I'm not I'm not trying to dodge a bullet I'm just saying that that w- what I look at is where are things at and how do I protect my money, right? And then as I get new data over time, I then input that data to the to my financial situation and what my long-term strategy is. So I think w- w- what I really want to do is I want to make sure that I've got downside protection on my portfolio and I'm very clear with what my methodology is. So maybe, you know, maybe I'm a guy who is using an option strategy where, where I'm buying puts based on the value of my portfolio and as things sink then you know I know that for really uh, that small insurance price I've I've got an option there maybe I have stop losses on my on my stuff um, you know maybe I'm uh, uh, maybe I'm just using an asset allocation where I'm very quickly making changes to my asset allocation when things when things move. Mm. I mean, I'm brick, uh, Brexit is an example. Just using that, you know. So diversified asset allocation, very simple strategy, right? All we're doing is we're putting money in different pockets. Kind of boring. Uh, when when one w- one asset class goes down, I'm then filling in that with something else. If I had done that, the, the that very week of Brexit. And I had then re just rebalanced my portfolio. Then I took this very simple, boring strategy that might not be the answer overall to my downside protection. And I actually made some lemonade where we just had lemons. Mm-hmm. So, but no matter what your downside strategy is, I think not having one is is the biggest problem that I see out there. Everybody has ways to grow their money. People don't think enough about what you talk a lot about on the show, Kenneth, which is how do you protect it? Sure. Well, you know what? Uh, you know, I'd like to get into that a little more with you. I mean, we are right sure. now, um, you know, looking at stock market valuations at the highest, basically, debt to earnings ratios of the century, above really what yeah. they were in, in 2000, 2008. So, um, you know, what what are your strategies at the moment, if you wouldn't mind getting into some of these? No, that's fine. Uh, you know, I'm I'm very intrigued right now with the one that I that I just mentioned, which is the option strategy. If I can if I can purchase the market where it's at now, let's say that you know over long periods of time the stock market goes up, uh, you know, roughly to ten point two percent, right? Over long long periods of time. So let's just take that. If if the we can never call when the market's actually going to drop, but like you said, it's been an extended, protracted run up, and now these valuations are very high. In fact, it's funny we had on our show uh, somebody from one of these new fintech uh, machine learning companies. It's called Kavout, and and you look at all 
all the Kavout data that these guys are looking at, and I'm not affiliated at all with their company. I just think it's pretty cool to look at their site. Hmm. They, you, you know, ever the market looks way oversold. I mean, you can't find you can't find anything on Kavout that shows that that, that there's not danger danger ahead. So let's say that the market does continue to go up further, though. So, so for the price of maybe one percent. I'm I'm buying this option that allows me the, the the fact to continue on the growth train, and the second that things turn the wrong way, uh, I get to buy back my portfolio at the value that it's at now. So I give up ten percent for nine percent, mm-hmm. and then when the market goes down, now I I have this option to buy it back. I'm really intrigued by that. I'm doing back testing right now on that right now. So I can't say that that's the answer for all of your listeners, Kenneth, but it certainly is an intriguing way to look at this problem when we don't know when the shoe's going to drop. Uh, Joe, I, and I, I know you spend a lot of time speaking to a lot of people, uh, and this is, we're talking about finance here. I, any interest in things like uh, Lending Club and some of these websites that uh, offer returns for people who are looking to invest their money. Do you, do you like those types of sites? I do. In fact, I think that um, I think that that we're going to see a lot more of that now that the crowdfunding rules have opened up. So not just you know lending club where I'm lending people money to to do whatever they have to do, but we've seen this happen with real estate now, where with the new crowdfunding rules, where instead of going out and buying a house, I can loan money to you, Kenneth. If you're somebody who's a house flipper, I don't have to become a house flipper. I can score a pretty good return on my money just by just by loaning money to you doing that mm-hmm. I think uh, I think we're gonna see that in a lot of different places and and that brings up some different dangers you know I mean if the economy falters I think more and more people are going to turn to entrepreneurship so I think that's exciting but it also means there's going to be a lot of people out there with some pretty crappy ideas <laughs> some pretty rotten ideas mm-hmm. that they're gonna want me to invest in so w- with a place like lending club they, they've really automated it right and and they've shown you, you know, they make it really easy for you to diversify and loan a lot of different people money. You know, people that I know that are doing this are earning eight, nine, 10, 11 percent, uh, which are some exciting returns. But you also look at the more risk that you take, the more when the market turns that that you know you could you could potentially see uh, a lot higher default rate there. So, do I like it? Absolutely. Do I like it with all your money? No. And do I think that uh, there's going to be a lot more opportunity there? Yeah. I'm really excited by the one that I just mentioned, though, Kenneth. I'm excited about these real estate companies. Mm-hmm. I think that um, I think that that's a that's a good opportunity to get into something with a more turnkey approach than having to go out and flip houses myself. Yeah, no, that's that is really interesting. Any indication that these are potentially Ponzi schemes or uh, right. any any way to to ensure people that they're not because you know to it just seems so easy on the surface. So the way you are able to just kind of walk in and throw your money in these, uh, into these services and start receiving the pretty substantial return. Well, we've already seen that a little bit, haven't we? Where the loans have gotten a little sketchier, and um, I mean, we've we've definitely seen the ground shake on the on the uh, the lending club type turf. Uh, and I th- I think the ground will always shake there, which is why it's the type of stuff that you guys talk about about knowing what you're getting into. I think is I think is so important. Like as an example, um, when we've interviewed people on our show about these r- real estate ones you know I got to know what type of due diligence these people are doing to make sure that that I'm I'm not getting into something that uh, as a third party that I know nothing about I'm not an expert on flipping houses I want to make sure though the person I'm loaning money to is an expert and I have to rely on that intermediary to really represent me well so I think you have to ask a lot of questions before you just you know hear that your brother-in-law did it so which is what I hear all the time right (laughs) my brother-in-law does lending club so i'm going to do lending club and i i think man you should probably know how that whole lending process works before you get in there yeah no i and i i figure you probably had spoken to people who've done it um joe i 
what what else do you look into? I know you speak to people yeah. all across the board. And I mean, what about real estate nowadays? I mean, we talked about the stock market, but man, it's tough to get out there in a market right now that has become pretty highly priced and it's hard to find yeah. cash flowing deals out there. I mean, are you comfortable purchasing real estate right now in the current environment with interest rates so low and prices very high and, you know, potentially on the verge of the next recession? Would you be comfortable Gr purchasing? Great. Y yeah, great question. The answer is yes. But I, but I have to tell you that, that a mistake people make with real estate is that where we can look at like the S&P 500 as the stock market, looking at the, the United States as the real estate market is a mistake. Because as an example, you look at some of the biggest cities, it's a, th there are horrible, horrible valuations that I, I can't imagine what type of math you have to do to make money in those in those markets but you look at at some of the the flyover markets where the real estate market certainly is slower um, I think there are good deals, but it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of legwork. The place where you make money in real estate is always when you buy it if you can't if you can't do the math to find the cash flow up front which which when i've talked to people about real estate and and you know getting in over their head in real estate it's because they didn't do the math up front to make sure that there's good positive cash flow up front so real estate having a renter in that house and then making sure that that renter is not just you know you see these things where people just cover the mortgage well, uh, what if what if you can't find renters that are able to cover the mortgage mm. later because the economy is worse? I got to have a lot more money than what the uh, than than what that mortgage is, uh, the mortgage, the upkeep. I've got to have a much bigger number to actually get into the into the real estate market. You know, a friend of mine, uh, Paula Pant at affordanything.com. Mm. She's written extensively about that. And I would point people to her because she has some some great equations on her site. And, and they're actually fairly easy uh, that you just walk through as you're evaluating real estate. And it's a, it's a nice series of filters to go through to say, is this a property I could afford? Is it not? But to your point, Kenneth, you know what's coming back most of the time is no because valuations are so high. Yeah. It's a really frustrating market across the board. I mean, you can't buy bonds right now, right? right. Because the other shoe's going to drop there. It's dangerous to buy stocks right now. Most of the real estate markets are overheated. Why don't we just go invest in beer? You yeah. Know? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, you know, and, and when it comes to real estate, it is really difficult to to even make money when it is cash flowing because you know how it is. You have a, a property and then all of a sudden the air conditioning goes out and that's, right. a, that's a big fix. And uh, I was talking to Marshall Riddick uh, uh, yeah, a while back and he even told me, he said, hey, you know what? You really don't get anywhere fast in real estate with just cash flow. It's really the appreciation and the leverage that gets people ahead uh, because, you know, expenses over time will, will get you. And well, um, I totally I totally agree with that, Kenneth, not to cut you off, but but I, I, I agree with that. And that's the issue. That's why that that delta has to be so high on the cash flow is because when these unexpected things come up, I can't have it cut into that appreciation on the property. I've got to make sure that the maintenance, the upkeep, the taxes, all of that stuff is covered so that I can actually realize the appreciation on the on 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 the property right yeah no i i have actually a couple in memphis tennessee in an area that you know most people probably wouldn't touch and uh i i love these these properties i yeah. mean literally between the 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 rent i get after expenses like you're talking about all those expenses uh the house literally paid for itself within six and a half seven years both of them and uh, when you consider it from that perspective even if i even if i this i sell it for zero now i i it burns to the ground i, I don't get any insurance money i literally lost nothing other than the time value of money but um i mean and so anything beyond what i get now you know as long as i i don't go into the negative territory here with expenses is all gravy and when i when i look at it from that perspective it's literally paid for itself 
after seven years. So um, I love that. I love that. And what's great about that, Kenneth, once again, fly over country, right? I was just looking at a house, you know, actually not far from Memphis in uh, Little Rock, which is two hours from me and, and a similar situation. I haven't jumped on that property yet, but I think that, um, I think that it's, fl- I think, I think you're right on there with Memphis fly over, fly over USA, I think is where your real estate deals are right now. Yeah. Well, Joe, uh, I, I want to continue this conversation here, but uh, the, we're, we're getting to the end. Uh, I want to give you an opportunity to uh, let the audience know uh, what they will receive if they visit you at their website and just, you know, the exciting things that you guys are doing. Absolutely. Well, thanks again for having me, Kenneth. And I can talk about this stuff for hours. I absolutely love the show. So Stacking Benjamins is uh, more of a podcast than our website. You can get it uh, anywhere podcasts are distributed. Uh, So iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play. Our show is very, very light. Uh, It is it is uh, definitely the joke we have on the show is that if you learn something, keep it to yourself. That's your problem. (laughs) We're more like uh, Car Talk. It's a magazine style show. We go over headlines. We take a couple listener questions. We, we have a guest, but those guests a lot of time are lifestyle. We cover everything from uh, uh, entrepreneurship, like a, a gentleman that was on just here recently on the show from the CW show Hatched uh, to big financial advisors like Rick Edelman to people that are doing things with the crowd sharing economy. You know, A lot of people trying to make some extra money uh, around the holidays, maybe deciding whether Uber driving or like you and I talked about you know we kind of touched on this but some people aren't doing long-term rentals they're doing airbnb instead Mm. so even if you're not buying new real estate doing that so we're all over the board at stackingbenjamins.com and the white paper that you mentioned at the start about gurus uh it's an incendiary title but really what i'm saying there and you can get more and it's a free white paper which is my passion which is i think people line themselves with the wrong guru i don't think there's anything wrong with dave ramsey Susie orman or or uh uh, or with the Motley Fool, I just think that people that shouldn't be listening to Dave Ramsey are listening to him. People that shouldn't be listening to the Motley Fool are listening to them. So mm-hmm. if you know what you want first, and then stick the right guru in the spot, you're much better off than just believing that you know this, Dave Ramsey is the guy who has all the answers. Well, I love it, man. Uh, you're you're an inspiration out there, and you're giving people. Uh, options, teaching people how to, you know, make actionable and take actionable steps with their life and kind of navigate through this really, really volatile economy. So again, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks a lot, man.